Hey folks, Joseph A. Sabora here. Yeah, I did turn on the air conditioner because my room started to feel very hot. I started to sweat a lot I mean, after I just rest for hours. So I just want to be able to feel relaxed and energized. But hey, I've done videos where I left the air conditioner on, so it wouldn't matter. Um, but anyway, I decided to do a new movie review this week. And it's a biopic that just came out recently in 2018 despite the fact that I didn't put this on my best list of that year because I didn't see the movie yet um, I was curious about how this is going to turn out even though I did saw the trailer and, and trying to see how this is going to become but, but now that I finally saw it it's already available on Blu-ray, DVD, and Ultra HD 4K already um, so who knows, maybe I'll, I'll take my chances. But it's the movie called Bohemian Rhapsody. That's the title song by the British rock band Queen, that's led by Freddie Mercury. And this is a biopic involving him and his band, as it seems. Now as you know, I love Queen. I love their music and their songs. I actually had two albums uh, that my parents bought. Uh, back in the 90s, you know, when I was only a little kid, because they actually did own their albums, uh, some of their albums uh, on vinyl. I still never forget that that vinyl that, that shows uh, a giant uh, tin man, you know, attacking the entire city. Um, yeah, that, that was that one cover that they got, um, which I believe that was the... Uh, Um, which I believe that was the, which I believe that was the the album called News of the World. So I never forget that uh, <laughs> that cover art. I mean that was really creepy. Yeah. Uh, but nevertheless, um, they had a lot of good songs. Uh, I love the songs like um, We Will Walk You along with We Are the Champions, which I know that was heard later in the soundtrack of the movie The Mighty Ducks, along with its sequels. Uh, they also did provide the, the soundtracks for films like Flash Gordon, from 1980, yes, a cult classic, and Highlander, They Can Only Be One. Yeah, they, they provided all the music for that, so it really worked. Love those songs. Um, I even love some other songs besides Bohemian Rhapsody, which I know that was later heard in Wayne's World. <laughs> Wayne's World, Wayne's World, party time, excellent. <laughs> and the fact that they're head bopping to the tune, and yeah, and the fact that they're lip syncing to it, I thought that was just fun. <laughs> but hey, I, I love Wayne's World. <laughs> okay. um, but they also had a lot of um, a lot of other songs I love, like Fat Bottom Girls. Um, uh, the bicycle song, um, uh, the song "You're My Best Friend," um, somebody to love, and all the rest. I mean, I listen to their songs on the radio too, as well as the album. So it's, it's really cool. Definitely the best band we ever got. Um, I was really looking forward to it too. When ever since I saw the trailer and all that. Because I heard that Rami Malek, the actor from Night of the Museum, the yeah, Night of the Museum movies, um, along with his uh, successful TV series, um, Mr. Robot, which I didn't see. It's on USA Network. Yeah, I know. I should check it out someday. But I probably won't be able to. So you know how it is. Um, the fact that he's uh, playing the role, I thought it was dead on. I mean, he definitely plays uh, exactly the way the character portrays, you know. He even study all the body movements that he does and everything. So he's starting to look like uh, that Freddie Mercury suddenly... So it looked like Freddie Mercury actually came to life. I mean, yes, he does also have his private life, but for his public life, you know, he formed it as a family, you know, joining in with Band members uh, Roger Taylor, you know, Brian May, and John Deacon. So, so even when they had their issues here and there, no matter what, 
They're best friends. Yeah. Especially when he, he fell in love with a young woman. You know, despite the fact that it started to affect his um, sexuality and everything. So. Um, also, the film... But yeah, the, that's why the... But also, the movie does have problems with its... Uh, the fact that the film isn't historically accurate through the facts because they didn't do the research properly but I know they're trying their best to put it all together plus it got middling reviews from critics so yes I know that what they said is right or wrong or whatever again you know sometimes I agree sometimes I disagree so I can't again you know sometimes I would agree other times I would disagree, so you know how it is. Even the movie had a backlash by itself too, by director Brian Singer, you know, the guy who gave us uh, the usual suspects in the X-Men movies. Um, he actually got fired uh, due to a leave of absence. Also had a fight with uh, the actor Raimi, and also because you know I think it was a family issue or the fact that he got ill. That's why. So they had to uh, finish uh, the last part of the movie when Dexter Fletcher stepped in. He was the original director, by the way. But he was given an uncredited um, director's... Uh, but he was given an uncredited, uh, uncredited uh, director's uh, choice. Because only one had to be uh, the member here. And Brian Singer is the... Uh, the is the director's is part of the uh, director's guilt of America, so that's why he's credited. Um, nevertheless, I mean, despite it being fired, um, but of course he was the but Dexter was also the original director. He wanted to do this, but he had to leave because he wasn't so sure how this is going to turn out. But he also served as the executive producer, even though he was indeed a, a DP. But they did have DP Newton Thomas Siegel to join, so there you go. But it's nice to see that Rami Malek had won the Oscar recently, so I'm happy and very proud of him. Even though I didn't watch the Oscars, I just heard about that he won. It actually won four Oscars, so it's good to see that they got the attention. So either way, um... It was enjoyable, so I'll. So I'm gonna state my. Uh, so I'm gonna state it uh, once I get to the review, and that's what I'm gonna start right now. Uh, it stars uh, Rami Malek, once again, Lucy Boylington, Gwen Lee, Ben Hardy, Joseph Mazzello, yes, from Jurassic Park, Alan Leach, Aiden Gillian. Tom Hollander, Tom Hollander, Mike Myers, yes, Mike Myers, <laughs> yeah, from Wayne's World, uh, sorry, Marion Axe Murderer, yeah, SNL, and all, Awesome Powers, Shrek, and all, Aaron McClusker, uh, Ace Bahati, and Derwent Murphy. Yeah. It's uh, written by Anthony McCartan. Uh, along with uh, Peter Morgan, they both came up with the story, and it's directed by Brian Singer, with uncredited uh, director's credit by Dexter Fletcher. The movie began Sunday London in 1970. We meet Freddy, whose real name is Fakwa Basara, an Indian refugee from Zanzibar. He has to study art at college, and works as a baggage handler in Heathrow Airport. But during that night, he goes out with his friends to listen to music at a local pub, and that's when Freddie found a band called Smile that was led by Tim Stafel, the lead singer, along with drummer Roger Taylor and guitarist Brian May, along with bassist John Deacon. Um, he also follows with, uh, with the help of an attractive young woman named Mary Austin, who also works at, as a clothing store called Bibba. So he begins to find out about that. Um, 
after the performance, uh, he went outside, tried to compliment uh, Roger and Brian on their performance, and after they learned that Tim had quit, Freddie offered himself as a replacement and demonstrate his vocal ability. And that's when he joined the band. And he changed his name from Smile to Queen. Uh, later on, Freddie had go to um, Biba to see Mary and approaches uh, and she approaches and helps him choose some of the clothes that he loves to, to try out for his style. And as that follows, the band decided to play gigs across Britain, selling out to pubs and, and universities around. And he also legally changed his name to simply Freddie Mercury. But Freddie suddenly urges the band to go extremely big or huge, so they decided to record their debut album uh, at, a, at a studio. Just when they sold their band, which is being broken down, they started to use other experimental sounds and techniques until an A&R rep from EMI Records had solved them and asked the, the RT, the sound engineer, for demos. So, so as far as that's concerned, um, the band was signed with um, Ellen John's manager, uh, John Reed, because they also received a contract from EMI. They, they later uh, made an appearance at Top of the Pops, which Queen actually gave their hit record called Killer Queen. So they've been touring around as years follow, promoting album after album, and sooner and very soon both Mary and Freddie were engaged. So the albums had hit the charts in America, and during their band sold out the US tour, Freddie suddenly begins his sexuality that's going around. Yes, because we did learn that he is bisexual. That's when he started to have an affair with um, with Paul Printer, who's uh, the day and day manager, and that's what led to what was going on too. But also in 1975, Queen actually recorded their fourth album, A Night at the Opera, which led to EMI executive um, Ray Foster because he refused to release, get this, a six minute song of Bohemian Rhapsody, you know, which that later became the most popular song ever, despite the fact that it got mixed reviews from critics. Um, so they, they refused uh, to release it as a uh, single you know, through the album. So Freddie decided that since they couldn't do it, they left, and Freddie decided to have uh, DJ Kenny Everett to debut the song on the radio, and that's how it became. Um, so yeah, it, it did lead to issues here and there, with Mary suddenly breaks up with Freddie, but wants up living next door to him at uh, the mansion. But the band just continues to rule their success, you know, come in with new songs after new songs, promoting albums after albums, you know, like songs like We Will Walk You and all those other ones. But then that's when Freddie's relationship um, with his bandmates suddenly becomes very sour, you know, during the 80s when, even though, yes, they, they were working with other stuff, we also learned that, of course, Freddie Mercury is a cat lover because he does have a lot of cats around at his mansion. So no matter what, he you know he always loves his cats. Um, they did a uh, music video where they were in drag called "I Want to Break Free." Yeah, I remember that song, and I remember the music video, which causes a controversy behind MTV when they aired it and they actually got banned after that. And what also led to problems was because Freddie had signed a four million solo deal with CBS Records which effectively uh, split the band up hoping to release a solo album from himself. 
but even that wasn't working out. Then things started to clash as it turned out, and then we begin to learn that that Freddie had an illness, that he's HIV positive, and he got AIDS, which I know that didn't happen until afterwards. But then he begins to find out about uh, the Live Aid concert in Wimbledon Stadium with hundreds of bands uh, performing just to help uh, starving children in Africa. Pretty begins to find out about what's going on and because of that uh, you know, he's, he told um, his lover Paul to to never see him again. They broke up and, and suddenly Paul just goes public involving uh, Freddie's uh, sexuality. Um, but due to the fact that everything was going wrong um, he said to beg for forgiveness from his bandmates, along with new manager Jim Beach, who joined in. And they're trying to um, perform on the day of Live Aid, so that way, hoping that he'll be reunited with Hutton and Mary together, reconnects with his family, and also begin to perform at Live Aid with songs like Bohemian Rhapsody, Radio Gaga, love that song too. Hamburger Fall and We Are the Champions, among others, which it's not heard in the movie. And that's when the rest became history, as it seems. So he already was energized as it is and you know, throughout his persona. Yeah, and I also love the fact that they show the transitions, you know, what Freddie looks like too, you know. You know, he used to have uh, puffy hair until he later uh, grew a mustache and sometimes a goatee but but he did grow a mustache and he also had a nice haircut so to make him look exactly different compared to um, what he usually looks like so I really love that so <clears throat> Raimi's actually studied uh, all the, the facial expressions and movements and his uh, buck teeth that he has <laughs> yes everything and then then we begin to see the sides of through the uh, the reporters you know where they're trying to explain about uh, his private life and everything that was going around he, but instead of talking about the album that they were performing yeah that was going on too or the fact that you know, they, they were having fights, you know, with decisions and everything. So it's not 100% perfect when it comes to this biopic. I mean, they're just trying their best not to turn this into a, a documentary or so. I mean, I know it's hard to do biopics these days if they had to do their research properly. But the fact is, they want to make this movie uh, good for their fans and non-fans out there hoping that this will become a winner. I mean, what really saved the movie was the performance of Rami Malek, along with the rest of the actors, including Joseph Mazzello, Ben Hardy, uh, Gwen Lee, and Lucy Borlington, along with Mike Myers and Tom Hollander. <laughs> yeah, I gotta say, it was really interesting to see uh, Mike Myers play an EMI executive, considering that he played Wayne in Wayne's World, and he actually played the song uh, Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. Um, which I guess is really funny because it almost seemed like it's not worthy. <laughs> so they try to make his uh, character look like an asshole, and, and even he made a mistake too. And boy, did he did. <laughs> um, so it sort of felt like it was an in joke uh, behind that. So I love how they went for that. Um, but the music really stuns and really shines. I mean, there are times when you can even tell that Raimi is either singing or they just had to dub um, all the music together, you know, matching their voices to sound exactly alike. And they really did a lot of techniques to actually put the film together in some ways. Um, and I, I know uh, the film did have its flaws with... Um, between uh, his life and and the way the band succeeds and and all these other details that they got wrong like for example they didn't perform 
in Rio. They actually perform in Sao Paulo, uh, Brazil. So that's one thing. And also the fact that that Freddie didn't have AIDS until 1987 when he found out about that. And that was after the Live Aid performance. So I know they got that wrong. So they, they got it. They got several things wrong, but it didn't hurt the film quite as much as, as it could. I mean, it could have been a whole lot worse. Um, but one thing I didn't like is how they're trying to make uh, Freddy look like a villain here. I mean, yes, he did make his mistakes with his behavior and everything that went for it. But in the end, you know, he made up for it. I mean, families have fights. They, they that's what he meant about that and. And the fact that producer Roger Taylor and Brian May wanted to keep it that way to this whole level so it won't become you know, a problem. But I guess I can see why fans and, and critics uh, have felt like you know they're not doing any justice to uh, his biopic here. I do love all the techniques that they put into in the film. I mean, like they even had some cinematography shots, you know, like when they showed the the entire stadium filled with billions of people around and now we begin to see uh, uh, Freddie performing live you know playing all these music well like for example when he his first uh, tune was Bohemian Rhapsody you know he's playing on the piano while while you see all these uh, Pepsi cups and beer cups around you know just so he'll be able to drink and he'll be able to stay still and become more energized and everything. But the way we saw him in the movie is exactly what we expected. It was very energetic and very strong and he really nailed it. Um, but at the end of the day, um, I definitely saw this movie with an open mind so I definitely just follow it through here and there and, and at least it's done for the fans and non-fans out there, so they appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, good or bad, it's worth the watch. So anyway, that's Bohemian Rhapsody, and I give the movie three and a half stars. I'm Joseph A. Sabora, and I'll see you later. Bye.